Good evening, everyone. I am Matteo Daffin, the president of the class of 2020. On behalf of my fellow students, many of you are here tonight, I'd like to thank you for making our Latin school experiences possible. In my own case, I'd like to thank you for the opportunity of last year's trip to Kenya through the Cloud Center for Global Understanding. I'm also an officer in the Youth Action Climate Network. I'm a founding member of the Young Men of Color and the Topo Fellow for Peace and Nonviolence. Tonight, tonight we will honor alumni for their achievements and reflect on ways BLS has set them on the path for success. That certainly was the case for one alumna who, one alumna who is here tonight, tonight. While she is not being formally recognized, she is always greatly honored. It is my privilege to recognize the 28th headmaster of Boston Latin School, Rachel Scarrett. Thank you, Mateo. Uh, Mateo and his twin sisters, who are class four students, are rock stars who impact our school culture for the better every day. Um, this evening, we will reflect on Latin school as a blueprint or a framework for life. As headmaster, I have the privilege of seeing young people working on their blueprints every day, whether it's in very public fashion like President Mateo, um, or many others working very quietly through their own steady progress as developing leaders, learners, and even simply as friends and community members. It's not always clear to teachers and administrators who the standouts are going to be. I'm sure that during his tenure, Mr. Conampasis felt the same way. Given the chance to name 25 rock stars from the early 1980s, I imagine that the name Michael Giordano may not have necessarily come to Mr. C's mind. But that's what that ever jovial boy from Charlestown became as a man, a rock star. The class of 1984's vice president never strayed far from alma mater, serving as coach, classmate, and friend for years before returning for a formal role in 2002. We lost Gio just three weeks ago. Our BLS family remains in deep mourning. Tonight, let's take a moment to remember him. Michael Giordano, also known as Gio, just brightened your day. Every day with him, he made my life better. He left a smile on everyone's face. If you were having a rough day, just seeing how positive he was, it affected you in a positive way. He always was there to listen to you. If you needed something, you know you could always go to Gio. He did everything for everybody else and not himself. He was a man for others. He always saw the potential in everybody. Gio understood how important it was for students to have somebody who cared about them. He cared about BLS so much. He just loved what the school gave to him. He felt as though it was his duty to return to BLS and to give back to a place that has given him so much. He was BLS through and through, bled purple. Gio is the first one that always comes to mind whenever I think of what a coach should be. He loved the school and it translated into a positive force for good. While I don't think anyone could ever replace Gio, I think his legacy will definitely live on. He's left an incredible mark on the school community, his students, his colleagues. He was just an amazing person. He did everything for everybody else, didn't ask for anything in return, just the ultimate human being. There are not a great many people who can touch your heart. Michael was special. Gio's yearbook quote was, he'll leave a smile on every face I meet. And he definitely did that every single day of his life.
I'd like to take this moment to acknowledge the Giordano family, whom we're honored to have with us tonight. His wife, Cheryl, his daughter, Michael, I mean, excuse me, <laughs> his son, Michael, <laughs> his daughter, Lindsay. Um, <laughs> thank you, Giordano family, for sharing him so generally, generously uh, with us. We're so happy you're here with us tonight. Thank you. Gio's story parallels that of so many alumni of this great school. The path to lives of service and to the improvement of the human condition set in motion at BLS. We'll recognize this blueprint for life in the stories of this evening's other honorees as well. My colleagues and I often reflect on how we measure the value of an education. At our very special school, it's a privilege to watch our young people gaining academic skills alongside other life lessons, to see them mature into young adults, ready for, great, for greater challenges. While students win awards for their too numerous to name accomplishments as scholars, artists, athletes, and community leaders, we celebrate perhaps even more that they graduate with grit, with determination, perseverance, and readiness to take their BLS blueprint forward in building rewarding lives. In 1967, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. asked a Philadelphia audience of high school students to consider the question of life's blueprint. Tonight, I invite you to join class one students, Jack Tang and James Ogilvy, in pondering Dr. King's words as they interpret them through dance. But I'm going to really be brief today. I want to ask you a question, and that is, what is in your life's blueprint? This is the most important and crucial period of your lives for what you do now and what you decide now at this age may well determine which way your life shall go. And whenever a building is constructed, you usually have an architect who draws a blueprint. And that blueprint serves as the pattern, as the guide as the model for those who are to build the building. And a building is not well erected without a good, sound, and solid blueprint. Now each of you is in the process of building the structure of your lives. And the question is whether you have a proper, a solid, and a sound blueprint. Latin school taught me. Latin school taught me. Latin school taught me. Self-reliance. Determination. Tenacity. Drive. Values. To be fierce. Grit. 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 Face up to challenges. Head on. Pick yourself up. You can find your way anywhere. Latin school gave me. Latin school gave me. Latin school gave me. Fortitude. Success. Focus. Ethics. Academic Navy SEAL training. Academic Navy SEAL training. Academic Navy SEAL training. Brilliant classmates. Lifelong friends. Ties that bind. Perseverance. Butt muscle. 
Butt muscle? Butt muscle. <laughs> Sit in a chair and get the thing done. Latin school instilled in me. Grounding. Work ethic. Resilience. Confidence. Belief in myself. To make better choices. Not to go along with the crowd. Don't blame others when you stumble. The only person responsible for my success or failure is me. With effort and perseverance, I can do anything. How did BLS shape me? How did BLS shape me? How did BLS shape me? Boston Latin School has taught me there's no excuse. You just have to get your things done. BLS taught me the skills I need to build a future for myself. It really grounded me in who I am as a person and gave me the ability to show that to the world. I found myself through the opportunities that Latin gave me. Boston Latin School has paved a path for me for success. Latin School provided me with opportunities that I wouldn't find anywhere else. Boston Latin School gave me hope for a bright future. Latin School is a blueprint for life. Latin School is a blueprint for life. Latin School is a blueprint for life. Blueprint for life. Applause for them, please. <laughs> I asked them last January to choreograph something for our Martin Luther King celebration at school, um, and we're thrilled that they could share that original piece with us again this evening. Uh, it's now my privilege to introduce a member of the class of 1985, uh, CEO of Cabot Corporation and chair of the Boston Latin School Association Board of Trustees, Sean Cohane, who will present the outstanding recent graduate award. Thank you, uh, Headmaster Skerritt, and welcome everyone to a wonderful evening here. As a young boy growing up in Jamaica Plain, Jose Valenzuela, class of 2003, found himself on a challenging path. As an early Boston Latin School student, his trajectory was marked by poor school performance, a lack of motivation, and aimlessness. In wrestling, he found a path toward more purpose. Success followed quickly. Through the sport, he developed discipline and found community in fellow athletes and coaches while focusing himself academically and emotionally. Latin school achievement earned Jose the opportunity to pursue wrestling as a four-year varsity athlete at Williams College, after which he embarked on his career as a Boston Latin, Boston Public Schools teacher. While at Tech Boston Academy, he saw familiar struggles among his students, and so he established a wrestling team which later led to the founding of Boston Youth Wrestling in 2012. Over seven years, the organization has, as its motto says, given more than 3,000 Boston kids a fighting chance by helping them to develop confidence and skills for success, both on and off the mat. What's remarkable is that Jose has built this thriving organization in his spare time while working as an esteemed history and humanities teacher at Boston Latin Academy. Please join me in welcoming this evening the 2019 outstanding recent graduate, Jose Valenzuela, whose dedication to the youth of Boston earns him this extraordinary recognition. Jose. Um, thank you for this incredible honor tonight. If I'm being completely honest, I never expected to be on the stage. Uh, when I entered Boston Latin School, the courts that very year would strike down racial quotas in the exam school admission process, making my class one of the last to enter under the old system. 
ELS was an easy place to feel lost and unwelcome, and no small part because no one believed I was deserving of my seat. Going to Latin school is tough. Being Latino at Latin school is really tough. And yet, I'm standing here before you because of the opportunities the school provided me. During my sixth year, when I heard the homeroom announcements over the intercom for middle school wrestling tryouts, I rushed down to sign up, only to find out I was the only seventh grader to show up. <laughs> and the two middle schoolers that did show up, myself included, would be on the varsity team that year. <laughs> I, I weighed 90 pounds in the seventh grade, <laughs> for everyone counting. Uh, but that decision to wrestle would ultimately change my life and put me on this path that I continue today to use the sport of wrestling to transform the lives of young people across the city. And because of music and band with Mr. Pitts, and because of football with Coach Nieves and Coach Gio, and because of TAG, the Talented and Gifted Club, with Mr. Fernandez, Mr. Luis, Mr. Versa, and because of the Maple Leaf Exchange trips to Canada with Mr. Fulton, I can look back at all of the amazing opportunities afforded to me as a BLS student. And I can also know that there are kids all across that city that don't have the same opportunities I had. And it's why I continue to fight every day to make a difference. So I wanted to thank a bunch of people. Uh, I want to thank Peter Kelly and the BLSA for this incredible honor. I want to thank Rachel Skerritt for her uh, incredible leadership at the school. I want to thank my parents who supported me. On <laughs> the word is unconditionally during my time at BLS and throughout my whole life. Uh, my sister Paloma that inspires me with her amazing creativity and spirit. Uh, I want to thank my beautiful wife Talia who made it possible for me to even create Boston Youth Wrestling with her support, her patience. My son, Benny, whose personality is such a source of light in my, in my life. I also want to thank my staff at Boston Youth Wrestling, uh, including the incomparable executive director, Bjorg Wigny. Uh, and of course, I want to thank my BLS classmates uh, who are here tonight, including my Bush League family, who have been keeping me humble since 1997. They will not let me get too inflated uh, tonight on, on just this honor alone. Um, and I want to uh, wish congratulations to Mayor Hunchovsky on your amazing honor as well tonight. Um, thank you all for this amazing honor. Christine and I grew up in Roslindale together with two pretty strict immigrant parents. My dad's from Ireland and my mother's from Austria, so nothing was taken for granted. She's got this double immigrant DNA, so in a way she's sort of supercharged. When I think back of us growing up, the words natural born leader comes to mind. I would definitely consider Christine the alpha female of the neighborhood group of kids. People definitely looked up to her. When it came time for high school, Latin school is the high school if Christine could get in there. And she sat the exam and passed with no problem at all. She was a great student. She was really involved in debating and after school. It was almost obvious how proud and at the same time how thankful she was that she was able to attend Boston Latin a lesson that really resonates that I learned from my sister. A lot of hard work 
and being selfless will really get you places in life. For example, doing as well as she did in Boston Latin School opened up the door for her to go to Boston University on a full scholarship. She went to BU and when she graduated, she said, well, dad, I'm going over to Austria. And she met her future husband there. We actually met the first time in Austria in February and in May I asked her to marry me. What I liked uh, from the very beginning and still do very much is that she's compassionate and determined. She's definitely the person that you should look at when you think of following your passion and just putting in 100% effort no matter what you do. She follows through. I see it with when she was running. She would go to the meetings of the city commissioners and then there was an opening for the commissioner. So she decided I'm going to run for that. Becoming mayor makes sense because she has all the qualities that mayors need. She has great vision. She has compassion for people, and she has a polite assertiveness, which I think is one of the reasons why she's able to bring many people together despite their political differences. Christine is wonderfully warm. She's caring, she's committed, and she's passionate. She's a very selfless person. She puts herself secondary and gives to others. But one of the things that I've learned about her most recently is that she is extremely resilient. What we went through as a community on February 14th, how she took us and led us out of that instead of being a follower, she became a leader. How she lived up to the challenge as a mayor after the tremendous event on February 14th of last year was nothing but amazing. Christine was thrown into something that none of us could ever plan to do and she handled it beyond description. She was empathetic, she was compassionate, she was really an emotional stronghold for her community and continues to be today. To see her handle it so well was not a surprise to me at all. Growing up my whole life, she'd always been very good at like, taking on new challenges and was always very brave and strong in the face of any sort of adversity. Christine stays the course. She really is a role model for others to follow. Words best describing Christine compassionate, brilliant, and determined. Selflessness, honesty, and resilience. Caring and amazing. She's grounded, she's honest. To me, that's my friend, Christine Hunchofsky. I'm glad to know Christine Hunchofsky, and I'm glad to call her my friend. She's taught me that you can just keep on going, building on your experiences. It's her continual learning and her aspirations that I'm very proud of. It's definitely inspiration to see someone just following what they really love to do. She has done amazing things and she'll continue to do amazing things. No matter what anyone says, just show up and do the work. Ladies and, ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming the Honorable Christine Hinshofsky, Mayor of Parkland, Florida, member of the class of 1987, and now Boston Latin School's 2019 Distinguished Graduate. Thank you, everybody. Um, I think it's a little unfair that they do that before I'm supposed to speak, so they like make me cry. <laughs> um, good evening, everybody. I am both humbled and honored to be here this evening and to be presented with this award. <sighs> Peter can corroborate this. Um, when I got the call, I actually started crying um, in disbelief and in gratitude and in shock because I know um, the special place that this school holds in all of our hearts and in our lives and I know how much this means and I'm so appreciative of it. 
Although tonight, after listening to Matt O'Malley, I wonder if they thought I was the class of 1986, and that's why I got <laughs> Class of 87! <87. laughs> I want to thank Peter Kelly for all his hard work that he does with the Boston Latin School Association. He is a force to be reckoned with. And I want to thank all the BLSA Board of Trustees, the Awards Committee for honoring me this evening, and for all the work you've put into this extremely special event. Thank you for that. <laughs> Headmaster Rachel Skerritt, you are amazing. You exemplify everything that's special about Boston Latin School and your choice to come back and be the leader that you are of this amazing institution um, is just incredible, so thank you. <laughs> Jose, congratulations. Another perfect example of what makes Boston Latin School so special. We don't all know where we fit sometimes when we get there, but in the process of being there, something clicks and we figure out what our path is and what our purpose is. I also have to thank my family. I would not be who I am today without their patience with me. <laughs> my parents. My husband, my kids who remind me that I don't know everything and I'm not as cool as I might think I am. <laughs> but that's what keeps us grounded in life, so it's beautiful. And let me take a moment to recognize the distinguished graduates who are also here, if they would uh, stand. Um, Chuck Clough, Bill Schwabel, Mike Contempasis, George Canellos, Phil Landrigan, and Steve Grazer. Would you please rise so we can be recognized? <laughs> Last but not least, the class of 1987. We were often underestimated, but we were a very special group, and I thank you all for being here today. There you go, Tara. I still remember um, getting my acceptance into Boston Latin. It was a big deal in our household. You heard my dad actually in the video talk about it. It was the place to be. And um, I thought, wow, it's so cool I got in. But I don't think I realized, and I know I didn't realize at that time, the impact it would have on my life. I still remember sitting in the auditorium. So you look to your right, look to your left, something like that. One of you won't be here at graduation. And I know they don't do that anymore, but it made it seem like, you know, making it through was a big deal, and it was. And even though graduating from Boston Latin School was an accomplishment, we weren't just there to learn. We weren't just there to be the smartest people in the room. We were there to be part of an established legacy. What were we going to do? What was I going to do to make the world a better place? How was I going to make a difference? It wasn't just about knowing things. It was, what are you going to contribute to this world? While these questions were not in the handbook, they were ingrained everywhere at Boston Latin School, in every class and in every activity. There was a history of Latin School alumni who came before us, and many of them who had found a great purpose and had given back to their country and others. So while Latin school was challenging, some of my most vivid memories include, include having philosophical discussions with Mr. Salterio, I remember Greek class with Dr. Desmond, civics class with Mr. Sheridan, and he lived around the corner from my dad, so it was always weird when I'd run across him in the street. <laughs> 
We had some exciting adventures in Italy with Mr. Regan. Mr. Regan's here tonight. We saw him. And then declamation in Mr. Hannigan's class. Now, yeah. Mr. Hannigan was quite an imposing figure. And I remember after declamation, he said I did a good job, but he was very glad that I wasn't living in his household because I think I had brought a little too much passion to my declamation. And, and uh, not much has changed over the years. <laughs> you see, Latin school was forming us into critical thinkers, students who would find purpose in our lives. We were seeking that purpose. I met people from all different backgrounds, from all different places, and just having the same experience at Latin school reminded us that we were the same in so many ways and that people could have different viewpoints because they had different life experiences. And those experiences were valid and they were respected. Those lessons that I learned at Latin school were also some of the lessons that helped me through February 14th, 2018. And it was a tragedy that made us, unfortunately, well known across the country. You see, I was never going to go into politics because I'm a bit of a straight shooter, shall we say. Um, kind of tell it like it is. I want to get, you know, roll up my sleeves and get things done. And that doesn't always go over well in some political circles. Um, I was never one to hold back. But um, when we moved to Parkland, our oldest was two, and I was pregnant with our youngest, and I didn't know anybody. My husband worked a lot, so what do you do? You get involved, because everybody loves a volunteer and a helper. If you're going to help someone, all of a sudden you get brought into the fold. So I got really involved in the community immediately, whether it was the Moms Club, on our parish council, I was on our education advisory board, I coached soccer, I coached baseball. And then eventually, I started covering the city commission meetings because our publisher's person quit, and she ran into me and said, you want to cover the city commission meetings? I'm like, well, I'm not a journalist. I don't even know where City Hall is, but sure, let's try. Why not? And I ended up doing that for 10 years. And then when the District 2 commission seat opened up, everybody was coming to me and saying, oh, you should run for commission. And I'm like, well, I don't know if that's like my thing. And um, with the encouragement, especially of my husband, uh, I decided to run. And I remember filling out the paperwork and that night turning to him and saying, what did I just do to myself? And then it came to me that I wanted to be the example to my kids especially that I could be the elected official I always wanted to see, the one that was just there to serve. Um, I didn't have a side business. I'm not an attorney trying to you know, get some work out of this. I wanted to show that you could be a successful elected official by just doing the work. And then our mayor decided that he wanted to run for county commission. And I never wanted to run for mayor. Um, that was kind of like the face of the city. And if I were in the theater, I would be the director. I would never be the leading lady. <laughs> And it would be me, for me to step out of my comfort zone. So initially, I begged him not to leave us, but he did. And um, I listened to everybody, and I decided to run. And I knocked on tons of doors. I believe in grassroots campaigning. I believe your job is to be out there to be accessible and let people tell you what they think and to be honest with them back. And after that hard-fought race, I ended up winning. And that was November 2016. And we were just a small city. We're only 33,000 people. Nobody knew who, where we were, not even the people in Boca who were just north of us. <laughs> and we actually liked it that way. We were a small, close-knit community. Everybody kind of knew everybody from being on the fields or volunteering. And we liked it that way. It was something special for us. Then in September 2017, so I hadn't even been in office for a year, we had Hurricane Irma coming our way. And at one point, we were seen as a direct hit for Hurricane Irma. Thank goodness that never happened. But leading up to that, I was getting calls from people whether they should move out with their families and leave the area. And I jumped into action by communicating with people. I took 
some pictures of myself putting up our shutters and putting my checklist out on social media to kind of show people how they could empower themselves so they wouldn't be so scared. And then afterward, it was all about cleaning up and getting FPL to get their electricity back on. And our city is so special that as soon as their electricity was back on, they're like, Christine, where do we go to help the people in the Keys who really need the help? And that was always something that I loved about Parkland. I thought that was going to be my biggest challenge as mayor. And then February 14th, 2018 happened. I had just gotten home uh, early in the afternoon after a meeting, and I got a call that there was an active shooter at Stoneman Douglas. First, I thought, are you sure? Can somebody double check? But the development we live in is diagonally across from the high school. And I heard more sirens go by than I had ever heard in my life. So I decided to go as close as I could. I drove over there. And I got there just before the parents were showing up. So they hadn't even cordoned the area off yet. And I just felt like my job there was to calm everybody down, give them any information I could, and just kind of be there for them. I was there when the first students started coming out. And I remember specifically one girl who fell into her mother's arms. It was extremely emotional because we all know each other in Parkland. Um, something about a small city, something about local government is that these aren't just my residents, these aren't just my constituents, these are my friends, uh, these are my neighbors. At some point, I had been told there were two casualties, and then I had been told there were seven, and then I had been told there were 11. It ended up being 17, but I remember the number 11, because that's when I knew that we would now be one of those places, Columbine, Sandy Hook, and now Parkland. And even though nobody had known us before, the pressure found us real quick when this happened. And we were inundated with the press. And I was getting lots of calls for interviews, and I didn't want to talk about the killer. I didn't want to talk about what went wrong. I wanted to talk about the community I loved. I wanted the residents of Parkland to see that I felt I knew we were going to get through this together, even though I might not have been so sure at the time. I wanted the world to know that we were humans, that we had feelings. This wasn't just something that happened. This was a tragedy that happened to people, real people with real feelings in a real community. I wanted that to be our focus. So this happened about 2.21, at 8.30 that night was the first time I looked at my social media. And I saw that people had been looking for my friend Jen, her daughter Gina. So I texted her immediately, said, is Gina okay? My friend Jen Montalto, all of a sudden I see the phone's ringing. I'm like, oh, thank God, she's calling me. And she called me to tell me that she had lost her baby girl. Later that night, at around 11.30 at night, I went to the Marriott Hotel where they had everybody, um, all the families who were waiting to hear what happened to their loved ones. I walked in and I saw Lori Aladef, who I had just been at a debate tournament two weeks prior, we were both judging. Her daughter Alyssa was killed. Fred Guttenberg ran up to me and told me that his daughter Jamie had been killed and we had just been at a ribbon cutting two days before. I saw Manny and Patricia Oliver. Their son Joaquin played baseball with my son John. And then I saw Tom and Gina Hoyer. Gina and I had several mutual close friends and our oldest sons had played soccer together. Gina had asked that I accompany the, her, the family, and their closest friends to go to the room where they were gonna be told the fate of their son Luke, who was just 15. I will never forget those moments ever. The following day, the names of everyone who was killed, they were all published. And the press continued to be there and I continued to talk about our community and our strength and our ability to get through this. This was a Wednesday afternoon and at Friday morning, at 4.30 in the morning, um, 
Dave Briggs, who's ever up early and watches CNN, he had um, interviewed me. And for those who might not know, he was actually a student reporter at Columbine. So he was very affected by this. And somebody else who was being interviewed by him that day was Nicole Hockley, whose son Dylan was killed at Sandy Hook. And I remember crying to this mother who had lost her child several years before. And she warned me about the tsunami that would hit. So what happens in a traumatized community is everybody becomes divided about everything. Who suffered more? Who got more attention? Who has more information? Everything becomes an issue and people argue over everything. She warned me about that. And then I said to her, I don't know if I'm the person to get our community through this. And she said to just always remember why you're here. And that was kind of what I had learned at Latin school. It seems so simple. What's your purpose? Why are you here? And that has been my guiding principle ever since this happened. My focus was solely to keep our community intact. My focus was solely to make sure our community had the resources it needed. And my focus was solely on the 17 families who needed somebody to stand with them. No matter what happened in the following weeks, I never lost that focus. I would go anywhere, whether it was to the White House, to the State Capitol, to any meeting, I would go there to make sure that we could get what we needed for our community. We were fortunate that we had incredibly savvy students who started this movement for common sense gun safety. I've known several of them since they were here, so no crisis actors, just to be clear. They were amazing, and they were the right voice for common sense firearm safety. And because they took on that mantle, I had my role to take care of the community. So when all this happened, we had legislators and elected officials from the state, the county, federal government coming in. But then, when the press is gone, a lot of them go away too. And it's left to us on the ground to take care of our community. We were one of the safest cities in the country. Something like this was not supposed to happen ever. Kids are supposed to be able to go to school and be safe. So when you have a traumatized community, all trust is gone because everything people believe is no longer valid. It's no longer true. So the job then is to rebuild trust. And the best way to do that is to show up, to keep showing up. So I showed up at funerals, at meetings, at hearings, at schools, at parks, at events. Everywhere I could, I showed up. I had even showed up at a shiva for one of the family members, and the mother actually screamed at me in the house in front of everybody. And um, I stood there, and I took it, cried on the way home. But the next time she had an event in honor of her daughter, I showed up again because I wanted the community to know that no matter what happened, no matter how they were feeling on a good day or a bad day, I was not going to be anywhere but by their side. It has been difficult in the days, weeks, and months afterward. Every time there's another shooting, it affects our community and reopens all the wounds. But together, we work together to support each other. Before coming here tonight, I went through my yearbook. And aside from noticing the very questionable fashion and hair choices. <laughs> oh my. I look back to see what my senior year quote was. And the quote that I had chosen senior year was, in a world where all contend, we ought to stop and be a friend by George A. Guest. That was the quote I chose 33 years ago, and it remains very true as to how I think today. In a day and age when it's all about the 24-hour news, news cycle, the constant breaking news, the outrage, 
the celebrity status, name ID, Twitter followers, at a time when leadership and strength are looked at as who can yell the loudest and who can cut down the person next to them the quickest. It can at times seem that we've forgotten about the question we were challenged with at Latin school. How are we gonna make this world a better place? What are we gonna to contribute to this world? What is our purpose? And with all the noise around us, it's really important in this day and age that we find the quiet spots, that we carve it out, and we remember why we're here. As I learned at Latin school, no matter what our diverse backgrounds are, we all have a unified wish to live in a safe and inviting world with opportunities and connection to one another. And instead of being focusing on division and being part of the circus, it's more important that we keep our heads down, look straight ahead, and focus on our purpose. It's important that we show up for one another we remember why we're here, and we remember we're here to make this world a better place. Thank you for this award. This is an honor of a lifetime. Thank you. Um, hashtag leadership goals is really all I could say. Christine, it's clear how you've used BLS to lay the blueprint of your life of service, and now I'd like to present you formally with this award. The plaque is completely in Latin. Fortunately, there is a translation because it's been a long time since 95 and 87. It's been <laughs> um, The plaque reads, the highest award of the Boston Latin School Association proudly given to a most deserving daughter Christine McGuire Hanshofsky, 87, Distinguished Graduate of the Year. An exemplary leader, steadfast in her commitment and admired for her abundance of grace, strength, and devotion to the residents of Parkland. A dedicated public servant whose legacy is guided by an unwavering sense of purpose to help her own community and others facing similar tragedies to move forward an effective partner who skillfully harnesses resources to support friends and neighbors affected by tragedy, a tireless advocate bolstered by determination and perseverance forged at BLS whose efforts fortify the close-knit sense of community that defines Parkland, a powerful and compelling voice to local, state, and national policymakers, inspiring them to effect positive change, encouraging all to find common ground for the greater good a proud daughter of Boston Latin School, whose life and purpose stand in testament to alma mater's legacy and influence, November 16, 2019. And now it's time for dinner, everyone. <laughs> um, we'll continue our program at dessert. Thank you. We're now at in-school suspension for a couple of folks taking their time. OK. Welcome back, everyone. I hope you've enjoyed your meal and conversations. As is clear, our students and faculty are not short on accomplishment. 
Just last month, physics teacher Aaron Ozawicki received the Presidential Award for Excellence in Science Teaching. Earlier, yep, that's awesome. Mm -hmm. Earlier this year, we celebrated victory as New England champions on High School Quiz Show. I know everyone was watching. We marveled when 31 students from the class of 2019 earned admission to Harvard University. And we cheered when track, fencing, golf, basketball, hockey, baseball, and volleyball athletes made deep postseason runs, not to mention a fencing state championship. And we rejoiced when Lily Tran and Gabby Izzo won national cha championships. That's in the whole USA, folks. Um, in powerlifting and figure skating, respectively. <laughs> and while it would be fun to showcase their talents here tonight, there are limits to what this room can actually accommodate. Um, but it's a little easier to share with you the talent of student performers such as Jack and James earlier tonight, and now class one students, Tony Eng and Leo Kodiga. Um, <laughs> in partnership with the extraordinary Paul Pitts, class of 1973. <laughs> Mr. Pitts, who's program director for the Fine and Performing Arts at BLS, was recently um, awarded um, by Berkeley School of Music, the John Laporta Jazz Educator of the Year Award. <laughs> Tonight, he and his students share with you Duke Ellington's Cottontail. Enjoy. <laughs> Thank you to our trio. <laughs> that was an excellent example, not only of our students' talents, but also of our faculty's many gifts. And sincerest thanks to all of you for your gifts to BLS. Without them, our school simply wouldn't be what it is, and our students couldn't soar as they do. Please be generous and faithful, and I pledge that in return, we will always make you proud. Thank you to all, thank you. <laughs> Thank you.
Thank you to all of our sponsors for this celebration. Their names are listed in your programs, but I extend my special gratitude to our platinum sponsors, Sid and Deanna Wolk, as well as Nancy Pryor. As we're closing, I'd also like to extend a sincere thanks on behalf of the Giordano family. They're very touched by all of your well wishes and sincerity as you um, um, stop by during the, the dinner and just all of the, um, the love that you've shown them over the past several weeks. So they're very grateful. So thank you for that. And let me say thank you for being here. Your presence at these celebrations builds our community. This event has evolved over time, and though we may not celebrate in the same fashion every year, I'm sorry we were unable to play the quiz this year, Dr. Grazer. Um, we really do depend on your presence and your advocacy in addition to your philanthropy. Um, congratulations again to Jose and to Christine and their families. Dessert is served in the foyer. Please stay and enjoy one another's company and have a wonderful evening and holiday season. Enjoy. Thank you.